before you meet the class. And let me do share screen. Okay. So as usual, I'll just start here with a few quick announcements. Um, Monday's lecture is on YouTube, so that recording went just fine. So hopefully you can view it without any issues. If you do have any issues, just please let me know. Um, office hours will be at the usual time, usual place. We'll have it 11 to 12, and then also from 4 to 5. Um, and again, if you can't make any of these times, just send me an email. I'll be around for it. And then finally, the next homework assignment is going to be due this coming Friday. So that'll be homework assignment number six. Um, I've just been a little bit slow about grading homework assignment number five, but hopefully I'll have that up and posted in the next day or so. Okay, so let's do a quick recap of where we were on Monday. Remember that we were doing a lot of review of different properties when it comes to rents. So first I wanna start off with this idea of being an integral domain. The simple idea is that if the product of two numbers is zero, then at least one of the two numbers must be zero. So that, that is what an integral domain is. So I don't wanna have a zero divisor, which means two non-zero numbers where if I multiply them together, I get, get back zero. And the typical example of an integral domain is like the integers. Next, we'll say that we have a unit if I can find another element in the set so that the product is equal to one. Next, we have the idea of a polynomial ring. So here, what we'll do is we'll just take a variable x, which we can also call an indeterminate. And a polynomial is just a formal sum of powers of x where we have to multiply by coefficients. And we'll put everything together so that at the end of the day, we have this ring here, right? this so-called polynomial ring. So the main thing to remember here is that if you start with an integral domain, then the polynomial ring is also an integral domain and you know something about the units. Right, so this actually gives us a really fancy way to create more and more examples of integral domains. So we're going to actually use this quite a bit today. Next, we'll get into the idea of ideals. So first we say that a subset is a subring if it's non-empty, if it's closed under taking differences, and also closed under products. So the difference here between S being what I'm calling a subring and an actual ring is that I'm not assuming that the number one is in the set. Right? If one were in the set, then S itself would be a ring as far as I'm concerned. So a ring homomorphism is a well-defined map that goes between two rings where I have to keep track of three different structures. So first it takes elements to elements, second it keeps track of the additive structure. So the image of the sum of two elements is the sum of the images. And similarly, it has to keep track of the product. So the image of the product of two elements is the product of the images, right? So that's simply put what I mean by a ring homomorphism. An isomorphism is a homomorphism that's very nice. So it just means that everything is one-to-one -one and onto. So if I'm given an element in R, that corresponds to a unique element in S and vice versa. And so if we do have one of these bijective ring homomorphisms, then we'll just simply write the symbol here and we'll say that R is isomorphic to S. So the idea of isomorphism is just like in linear algebra when you have an isomorphism between two vector spaces. This here is actually a generalization of that. The main thing is we're gonna use this today to kind of keep track of what do we mean to say that things are equal. So we kind of want to say that, say, two rings are equal if there is a ring isomorphism. And so finally, putting all of this together, if we have a ring homomorphism, then there are two subrings that come about from this map. One is the so-called kernel. So this is a subring of our domain R, and it's the set of elements that map to the zero element. So the kernel is a set of lowercase r and capital R, such that the image here is equal to the zero element. Similarly, we'll say that the image is a subring of the codomain S. 
So it's just the set of elements that look like they come from some element lowercase r and capital R. So again, if you have a ring homomorphism, there always are these two. There's the kernel, which is a subring of R, and the image is a subring of S. Okay. So then we have the concept of ideals in a slightly more general sense. Say that we have a ring, and let's let I here be a subring. So first we have the concept of a coset which is just the set in this form. So it's elements of the form A plus X. And then we have our cosets here, which are just a set of sets. So every element in R mod I, it's itself a set, it's a coset. So this gives us a set of equivalent statements that allows us to make a definition. So if we're given a proper subring, then Saying that it's the kernel of a map is the same thing as saying that you have this property here, right? That R times X, R times X is in I whenever both R and X are in I. So somehow it's very strong condition to be closed under multiplication. And third, the quotient here is itself a ring with identity, right? R mod I. So if any of these three equivalent statements holds, We'll say that our subring is an ideal, and we'll say that this ring, R mod I, is our quotient ring. Okay. okay, just a few more things. Next, let's only focus on the case where we have a commutative ring. So again, think of like the integers. That would be kind of our standard example. The following are equivalent if we're given an ideal. So first, we'll say that the product, if the product is in our ideal, then at least one of the two elements has to be in the ideal. That's equivalent to saying that this quotient ring is an integral domain. Right? So if either of these two equivalent statements holds, we'll say that our ideal is a prime ideal. And the collection of all prime ideals is what we're calling the spectrum of our ring. So once we have the idea of a prime ideal, then we actually have a nice way to send some prime ideals to other prime ideals. So say that we have a non-zero homomorphism between two integral domains, R and S. Then we have now a map that reverses the arrow, so-called pullback, that says if you start with a prime ideal P and S, then the inverse image is a prime ideal in R. So again, the whole point here is that if we're given a ring homomorphism, then this map here actually reverses the arrow. So it takes prime ideals in S over to prime ideals in R. And then finally, we have this idea for maximal ideals. So we'll say that a proper ideal is maximal if one of these two equivalent statements holds. Either there is no way I can find an ideal R that is properly contained in R and properly contains M. So this just means that I doesn't equal R and I doesn't equal M. That's equivalent to saying that this quotient ring, R mod M, is actually a field. So it just means that every non-zero element is invertible. Every element is invertible. So again, any ideal that satisfies either of these two equivalent statements is called a maximal ideal. So we'll put all of these together here into what we're calling M-spec. And I just want to point out that because a field is an example of an integral domain, that every maximal ideal is prime. So M-spec is always contained in spec. In some sense, M-spec is going to give us a lot more, from, going to give us, be a lot more precise, but spec of R eventually is what we're going to want to work with. Okay. All right. Now, with all of this together, I then want to start to move more into what's happening with algebraic geometry. So we've seen that non-zero ring homomorphisms on integral domains induce a map on prime ideals. So what I want to do for the first bit of today is discuss the kernel of R, the image of S, and how this might all be related to what's happening here with the specs. 
So first, let's say that we have two rings and a ring homomorphism between the two of them. So I want to let I be the kernel of this ring homomorphism. So remember that I said just a minute ago that I here will be a proper ideal. So our I here will be an ideal. All right, so here we have an ideal. And so then R mod I is a ring. And the statement is that it's actually a subring of the image. So this is what's called the first isomorphism theorem. It actually does give a nice way to relate the image and the kernel of a ring homomorphism. So again, the kernel here is an ideal, and R mod I always looks like a subring of the image. Right, so we'll kind of play around with this a bit more today, but we have these statements here. The diamond isomorphism theorem is a little bit more complicated to explain. But first, let me just try to say it in words in the following way. If we have a ring, <clears throat> let's just let A be a subring, and now let's let B be a very specific subring. It's an ideal. All right, so B actually has a bit more conditions on it. I can take a look now at the sum of pairwise elements, so A plus B. So the first statement is that this here is a subring, right? Not necessarily an ideal, but this here is a subring. The intersection is actually an ideal. And then we have these two isomorphisms here. So A plus B mod B is isomorphic to a mod A intersect B. So remember that B is an ideal. So A plus B is a ring, and it kind of makes sense, or I should say at least A plus B is a subring. So this quotient ring makes sense, right? A plus B mod B. On the other hand, A, a intersect B is an ideal. So A mod A intersect B should also make sense. So with this theorem here, the diamond isomorphism theorem says is, there's a way that we can put all of this together. So I want to show here on the next slide graphically what's going on here. So why do we call this next one here the diamond isomorphism theorem? All right, so the picture looks as follows. So let's take our ring R sitting up here at the very top. Then we have our ideals, or sorry, I should say our subring A and our ideal B. Now part of the theorem says that A plus B is a subring. So I've only put circles around the three subrings that we have here, right? R, A plus B, and A. So A is actually a subset of A plus B. Okay, that's what this says here. <clears throat> a is a subset of A plus B. Well, the next part of the theorem says that B should be contained in A plus B, but more importantly, the intersection here is contained in both A and B. So because it's contained in both of these, it's sitting here down below, and now this here is an ideal. So notice that I put boxes around the ideal B and the ideal A intersect B. This one here at the bottom is actually the zero ideal, so we can ignore this here for now, but it just says that the zero ideal is always at the bottom, but then everything here is contained in R. So the third part of the theorem says how different parts of this diagram here are related. It says that if I have now B as an ideal sitting inside of the subring A plus B, then I can discuss this quotient ring, A plus B mod B. On the other hand, a intersect B is an ideal sitting inside of this subring A. So the quotient here makes sense. And so the theorem says that this quotient here, right, A plus B mod B, should be isomorphic to A mod A intersect B. Right? That's why I put the double lines here around these. So again, it says that A plus B mod B should be isomorphic to A mod A intersect B, right? So that's why we call this the diamond isomorphism theorem, which you can kind of draw everything into a diamond like this 
and then stare to see how the different parts of the diamond are related to each other. Now there is a direct corollary to these two here, which will be of interest to us. So here's where I want to pause for a minute and talk about this direct consequence of these first two isomorphism theorems. Well, let's start with the field that's algebraically closed. So here I can write it this way. So this just means that the algebraic closure is equal to F. Think of F as like the complex numbers, right? So that's kind of a standard example of a field that's algebraically closed. Once we do that, I want to consider this ring that is the polynomial ring over n variables. Right, so take any polynomial that you want, just formally look at sums of powers of these different variables here, x1 through x2 through xn. So there's two statements here. Number one, this polynomial ring is an integral domain. Right, so if you start with the, with the field, then your polynomial ring over n variables is an integral domain. So this kind of gives a very nice example of an integral domain. Number two, let's take a look at maximal ideals sitting inside of this polynomial ring. Then I claim that every maximal ideal corresponds to these n numbers here, a1 through an in the sense of it's generated by these n polynomials. Right? So x1 minus a1, x2 minus a2, so on and so forth. So that means actually I know a lot about the maximal ideals of this polynomial ring. Right? They, they are all corresponding to this collection of n numbers. So yes, in the next lesson, we're actually going to explain how this is related to n tuples. Right, so every maximal ideal should be related to exactly one in two. Okay, so let's try to go over the proof of this. It's actually not as bad as it looks. I want to try to prove the very first statement here by induction. So I'll prove it by induction on the number of variables. That is, I want to show that if I have a polynomial ring over n variables, then it is an integral domain. So let's start with <clears throat> n is equal to one. So in this case, then I have a ring, polynomial ring in one variable, defined over field F. But I mentioned before that a field is an integral domain and the polynomial ring over an integral domain is an integral domain. So if I'm just dealing with one variable, then this R1 here must be an integral domain. All right, so let's say now maybe we've shown that up to some integer m, that this polynomial ring in m variables is an integral domain. So then the next step is to say, fine, let's now go all the way up to n variables, assuming n is m plus one, then I can think of this as a polynomial ring over one variable, but the coefficients were the previous polynomial ring. All right, so again, now what I'm doing is I'm looking at an inductive definition of a polynomial ring. So if I have a polynomial ring over one variable, I can generate a polynomial ring over two variables by assuming that the coefficients are polynomials themselves, and I just kind of keep going in this way. So again, a polynomial ring over n variables looks like a polynomial ring over one variable, where now my coefficients themselves are polynomials in M variables. But of course, Rm by the inductive hypothesis is an integral domain. And an integral domain over, or should say a polynomial ring in one variable over an integral domain is also an integral domain. So that takes care of the inductive step. So let's do the second part. So why is it that every maximal ideal is generated by n of these polynomials? So let's start with the maximum ideal. And now remember that maximal means that the quotient here is a field, R mod M. Well, if I look at R mod M, then this is actually a field 
that contains this field F. Right? I mean, simply put, what's happening here is I just have coefficients. And so if I have the coefficients, then that field F is always contained in this here. So R mod M has to be a field extension over an algebraically closed field, but algebraically closed means there are no such extensions. So R mod M has to be the field F. So I can write that to say that there should be some ring homomorphism that allows me to say this here. All right, so phi here is just some homo isomorphism from R mod M to F. Right, so here's where I crucially am using the assumption that we're working over an algebraically closed field. Because actually this theorem is even incorrect if it's not algebraically closed. So now that we have this isomorphism, let me write down the following ideal. So here what I'm going to do is look at the polynomial ring, but inside of that, I want to specifically look at these linear combinations. So here I have this polynomial x1 minus a1 times some polynomial g1. Here I have an x2 minus a2 times some polynomial g2, and so on and so forth. All right, so again, the g1, g2 through gn's, they are all polynomials in our polynomial ring R. Now I've defined a sub k as the image of this variable. All right, remember that we're mapping from R into F, so I can look at the image of this variable, that's just some element of F. Now, if you just stare at the way all of this works, R mod I has to be F. I mean, the reason being, if I simply evaluate, so take any polynomial in R and evaluate it at this number a sub k. So that means plug in x1 equals a1, plug in x2 equals a2, so on and so forth. So now I'm just evaluating at this coordinate. Then every polynomial in R looks like a number in f. Right? That's all that we're doing. Just evaluate and this is what you get. But if you evaluate, hopefully it's clear that this ideal here is in the kernel. So if I evaluate x equals a1, x equals a2, then everything in the set i will be the zero polynomial. So i here must be the kernel, right? It must be the kernel of the map that I've just told you this evaluation map. So now let me try to put it together in a couple of ways. So again, r mod i has to be my field f because I, I just told you exactly what the isomorphism is. But r mod i is a field, so i has to be maximum. Right, again, if r mod i is f, then r mod i is a field, so i has to be maximum. But on the other hand, these polynomials lie on the kernel, right, the kernel of this evaluation map. So if I just kind of stare at the way everything is set up, then I actually have to conclude that i is contained in this ideal M. But I just said that I is maximum. So there is no M where this is the case, right? M has to be I. Okay. All right, so in, any questions on this corollary here? Okay. All right, let's move on then. Okay. Let me talk about the third isomorphism theorem. It turns out that there's actually a total of four of them. So we're just gonna do the third one here. So this one is kind of a weird one. Kind of the intuition is that you want to invert and multiply. So let me try to say it in the following way. Say that you have a ring and let's let I and J be ideals. And let me assume that J is the larger of the two ideals. So first of all, the quotient here, J mod I is an ideal of this quotient ring. So again, if I is an ideal, J is an ideal, then J mod I is also an ideal. So then let's think of R bar as R mod I and J bar as J mod I. So then if I take a look now at R mod J, really R bar mod J bar, I can just get rid of the bars but intuitively, I'm just going to kind of multiply, kind of invert and cancel the i's. So I can just completely ignore the i's. Now I'll just have everything in terms of r and j. Right, so that's what the third isomorphism theorem says. 
that R bar mod J bar, just ignore the I, kind of invert and multiply. Okay. Then the fourth isomorphism theorem is what's called the lattice isomorphism theorem. And I don't want to get into the details of what this says. I really just want to point out this simple idea here. A is an ideal of R containing I. If and only if A mod I is an ideal of R mod I. So the ideals of R bar, namely A bar, are in one-to-one -one correspondence with those ideals containing I. All right, so if I really want to understand what's happening inside of R bar, I just have to take a look at R, look at those ideals, but look at only those ones that contain I. All right, so it actually gives me a very nice way to relate R with R mod I. So I'm going to give an application of this here. And again, this is something that we'll come back to later. So say that we have a ring. Really, we, we do want a commutative ring for any of this to make sense. And let's say that I is an ideal of R. Right, and so now I'll let here R bar be R mod I. So the statement is that the prime ideals, elements in spec of R mod I, or in one-to-one -one correspondence for those primes containing I. All right, so I don't just look at all of the primes of spec R, I just look at those that contain an I. All right, so if I want to understand spec of R mod I, I can do it by understanding spec of R. Right, that's, that's the nice statement here. Similarly with the maximum ideals. If I want to understand what are the maximum ideals in R mod I, that corresponds to looking at the maximal ideals in spec M spec R that contain I. All right, so not, I don't have to take a look at all maximal ideals, just those that contain I. And this here follows directly from the lattice isomorphism there. And again, we're going to come back and talk about this more later. So let me just try to give a quick sketch of how this goes. It's actually not, not a very bad proof at all. So first, let's say that P here is a prime ideal of R bar. Sorry, P bar is a prime ideal of R bar. So then by the lattice isomorphism theorem, P bar is in the form P mod I for some prime P contained in R but containing I. So I just need to really show that P is in spec R. Right, so again, I'm gonna start with something P bar that's in spec R bar, and I'm trying to figure out how does that correspond to a prime in spec R. So I've constructed my P using the lattice isomorphism theorem. So the last thing to do is to show that it's prime. But now let's go back to the third isomorphism theorem. This says that R mod P is isomorphic to R bar mod P bar. So now I can put the bars back in when I'm looking at I. But P is a prime means the R bar mod P bar is an integral domain. So that means R mod P must be an integral domain. So that actually means that P must be a prime ideal. And hopefully the converse here makes sense, how this all goes. All right, it's very similar if you want to do this with maximal ideals. So similarly, take an element from M spec of R bar, then this element in M spec of R bar looks like M mod I for some ideal between R and I. So now let's just ask what's happening. Is it an element of M spec? So I can take a look at the quotient R mod M which is isomorphic to R bar, my M bar, by the third isomorphism theorem. But this here has to be a field. So R mod M is a field. So M must be a maximum ideal. Right? And then hopefully the converse is true. Well, hopefully it's clear the converse is true. Okay, in the last five minutes or so, 
I want to try to see a little bit behind the topology that's coming into play here. So first, let me just try to remind you some of the definitions that we've been using so far, because we're going to try to do this and, and bootstrap things up just a little bit today. Say that we have a field, such as the rational numbers of the complex numbers. And remember that we have this idea of affine in space. So this is just the collection of tuples. That's right? so hopefully nothing fancy here. Next, we have the idea of projective in space. So here we just want to say that we have these equivalence classes. And remember that, say, for n is equal to 1, we'll say that two of them are the same if these quotients here, of course, are the same. So that's projective in space. And then we can always embed affine space in the projective space via a map in this way here. So what I want to do today is discuss a little bit more of what's happening with affine varieties, namely subspaces of affine space. So remember that we defined a polynomial ring. We can do this inductively. And so let's let F be our field and let's let R be this polynomial ring in N variable. So since F is an integral domain, we know that this ring R, of course, is also an integral domain. And let me write down this theorem that says that if you give me a collection of polynomials in R, then the ideal, sorry, the set generated by them, so I specifically mean sums in this form, this is an ideal of R. Right, so the terminology here will be the ideal generated by the set S. So again, it's just all linear combinations in this form. So here's the simple proof of why this i is an ideal. All I have to do is just show that r times x is an i whenever lowercase r is in capital R and x is an i. Right? That's just what it means to be an ideal. Well, since x is an i, then I can find polynomials where this is the case here. Right? Of course, that's just what it means for x to be in the set i. But now, let's just multiply things. So what is r times x? So here I see that I have x times f. I have an x times f. I have an x times f. Or just kind of distribute, move things around. Remember that it's a commutative ring, so we can do this. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. Oh, OK. All right, you're fine. And so I noticed that here, every product is an R. So R times X is an I is claimed, right? Just kind of the simple idea, just to put, make sure that you do have here an ideal generated by this. Now, moreover, remember that we said that this ideal is a prime ideal if and only if this ring here is an integral domain. So what I'm going to do is recall the following affine variety. So again, I is an ideal. Really, it's going to be a prime ideal. So I can talk about the quotient ring. And now let me look at the set of points that vanish on the generators. I can also think of that as the set of points that vanishes for everything in our ideal I. All right, so think of this as F1 through Fn, they're just some polynomials, and I'm asking about when do these polynomials all equal to zero at the same time. So that's what this VI of F means. So it's the vanishing set of these polynomials. So here's the fundamental statement that I want to end today with. Assume that we're dealing with an ideal that is prime, and let's let O here be this quotient then every element in the quotient can be viewed as a function. All right, so again, if I have now this quotient here, O, which is R mod I, that's an integral domain, then I claim that every element from this integral domain is actually a function from this variety to, P, to A1. So it just literally says, take a function, well, actually take a point, sorry, this wrote here, take a point P and then send that to F of P. So it's just the function. So here's the reason why. It's actually not as bad as it looks. I just have to be a little bit careful that everything is well-defined. Because again, I'm working inside of R mod I, 
So this here says something about cosets. So say that I am given a coset F, which of course I can write maybe in one of a couple of different ways. So maybe A1 plus I or A2 plus I, I just have some coset. Well, I know that the difference of these two has to be in I. And so that means I can write it in terms of my generators F1 through Fm. All right, so just kind of express it in terms of the generators. Now let me evaluate each one of these. Sorry, this is another typo here. So if I evaluate, remember that the Fs are chosen. So when I evaluate, they're all equal to zero. So this actually means that this here is well-defined. So it actually doesn't matter which coset representative you choose. I still have a nice well-defined element. Now I'm mentioning all of this because we're getting into a fundamental philosophy in algebraic geometry. So there, there was a strange mathematician by the name of Alexander Grothendieck, and he's really one of the ones that pushed a lot of these ideas from about the 1940s to about the 1970s or so. And his main philosophy goes as follows. Instead of studying a variety, study its ring of functions. So this is exactly what we're going to do. So instead of us really trying to understand this variety here, VI, we're instead going to focus here on this quotient. And we'll think of these here actually as functions. So somehow understanding the functions is really going to help us understand a lot more about the variety. Okay. okay, I think I do have more that I want to say, but I think I want to wait and say this all on Friday. So you have any questions for me before we call it a day here? All right, well, if I guess not, then thanks for your time and attention. So all of this will be posted up on YouTube pretty soon. I'll go ahead and have this put up there probably in the next hour or so. All right. Okay, all right, Thank thanks. You. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good rest of the day. You too. You too. See you. Bye.